Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, Episode 20, The Nika Revolt. Today we reach an event which pulls together many of the elements of the Byzantine story, which we've covered in our first 20 episodes. In episode 3, we saw citizens of Constantinople hurling bricks from their roofs in support of an insurrection. In episode 4, we heard the clamour of the deems turn to riot after riot as Anastasius's reign was peppered with civil disturbance. In episode 5, we saw the emperor take off his diadem and offer to leave office to calm the crowd. In episode 10, we walked the streets of Constantinople, visiting its famous monuments, and noting that many open hearths, plus many wooden structures, does not make for a fire marshal's dream. Finally, in the last three episodes, we've seen the discontent stirred up by the policies of Justinian, a discontent that had spread through every echelon in society. As January of 532 arrives, it feels like the history of Byzantium, as well as the reign of Justinian, has reached a critical moment. The new year was usually a time for races in Constantinople. The consular games took place in the first week, and by the second, it was time for games to mark the Ides of January. Around the 10th of the month, the Greens and Blues ended up in yet another fight during the races, and several people were killed. Justinian sent soldiers in to restore order, and by Sunday the 11th, the city prefect Eudaimon sentenced seven members of the deems to death. These were known violent criminals, and they were a mixture of greens and blues, so Justinian probably didn't think anything unusual was taking place. Since becoming emperor, he'd abandoned his favoritism toward the blues, and conspicuously dealt even-handed justice to the deems. Despite this, though, little had changed in their attitude toward him. The greens were still resentful of their mistreatment in the previous decade, and the Blues still assumed that they had friends in high places. Five of the executions were carried out efficiently, but something went wrong with the final two men. Their hanging was botched, and both fell to the ground still alive. The execution site stood next to the Monastery of St. Conon, and some monks who were watching gathered up the fallen men and rode them across the Golden Horn to the Church of St. Lawrence. When he heard what had happened, Eudaimon sent guards to retrieve the escapees. But the principle of a church being a place of sanctuary had already taken hold in Christian Byzantium, and the guards had to wait outside and aim to starve the men out. One of them was a blue, and the other a green. The guards would not move on Monday, as the leadership of the deems asked for them to be released. And by Tuesday... Tensions were running high as the Hippodrome filled for the races to mark the Ides. Justinian was present in the imperial box, or Kathisma, and both factions said loud prayers, begging him to be lenient and release the two men. These calls for indulgences from the emperor were clearly a common part of city life, and considering Justinian's stance of impartiality, it seemed likely to the crowd that he would grant freedom to the two men and please both sides. To their dismay, though, no positive word came back from the imperial officials. The Blues seemed to have been particularly angered by this refusal, perhaps realising that the Emperor really had turned his back on them. The leadership of both factions had clearly conferred by the time of the 22nd race of the day, as an organised cry went up, of long live the merciful blues and greens. Perhaps together their clamour would convince the emperor. By the end of the races, the deems began to chant as one the word Nika, meaning victory or conquer. Usually one faction would be chanting about their victory in the races, taunting the other side. Now Justinian looked down on thousands of people chanting as one and pointing at him. Nika, Nika, 
Nika. It must have been a deeply unnerving sight and sound. The emperor retired to the palace, but the crowd's blood was up, and a mob descended on the praetorium where the city prefect worked. They demanded the release of their compatriots from St. Lawrence's. The officials inside could give no answer, and so the crowd stormed the building, killing several people, releasing all the criminals who were being held inside, and then setting fire to it. Thrilled with their success, the crowd now raced to the Augusteon to further demonstrate their anger. They targeted the palace gate, the Chalk, and set it on fire. The fire burnt, and the gate began to crumble. But the Augusteon was not a large courtyard, and a wind blew north, spreading the flames across to the Senate House and to the Hagia Sophia. By the next morning, both had burnt to the ground. The church was the cathedral of the city, and had been built by Theodosius II over a century earlier. I have posted a map of the palace district at the history of Byzantium.wordpress.com if you want to follow the action. As devastating as that might sound, fires were a common occurrence in Constantinople, and for that matter, so were riots. Justinian was alarmed, but not seriously so. The blues and greens were always at each other's throats, their alliance wouldn't last 24 hours, and then things would return to normal. On the Wednesday morning, the emperor gave instructions that the races should continue, and hopefully the competition between colours would help restore the status quo. However, the crowd which appeared in the Hippodrome was angry to see that no concessions were forthcoming, and soon the north end of the great stadium was set alight. The Augusteion was targeted again, with its porticos being badly burnt, and the fires soon began to spread. This time, their victims included the giant baths of Zeuxippus, which stood between the Hippodrome and the palace. Rioters and palace officials alike looked on in horror as the baths collapsed into a great smouldering heap. The baths were much older than the Hagia Sophia, and had been adorned by Constantine himself with beautiful sculptures from across the empire. Carved mosaics and around 80 statues of major figures from the Greco-Roman past were all gone, forever. Justinian now began to realize the extent of the unfolding rebellion. His officials arrived soon after with messages from the leadership of the now united Green Blues. Their demands had moved on from the simple release of their fellow deemsmen. Now they wanted the removal from office of three senior officials. Eudaemon, the city prefect, was an obvious target. But interestingly, the other two names were Trebonian and John the Cappadocian. This was the first hint to those in the palace that the rioters were receiving input from other sources. The deems were known to take issue with local law enforcement, but it was unusual that they would attempt to remove the Praetorian Prefect, or the Quaestor. Those with real bones to pick with John and Trebonian were the senators, or the impoverished provincials, who had headed to the capital in the face of the new tax schemes. Regardless of his suspicions as to who might be involved, Justinian was seriously spooked and agreed to replace all three men. Their successors were announced instantly, each a deliberately popular choice, including a certain Phocas, who was renowned throughout the city for his honesty and probity. However, instead of appeasing the leadership of the revolt, these concessions fed their ambitions. The rebels decided to crown their own emperor. The natural candidates for the job were the nephews of Anastasius. It had only been 14 years since he passed away, and all three men lived in the capital. Hypatius and Pompeius were safely out of reach, up in the palace. A large group of senators had fled there after the initial disturbance, and so the choice fell on the remaining nephew, Probus. Probus. 
However, when the crowds reached his home, they were informed that he had, very wisely, left the city when he saw which way the wind was blowing. His house was burnt down by the frustrated rebels. Justinian grew increasingly restless up in the palace. Historians have surmised that some of the senators taking refuge with him were secretly sending messages to the leadership of the Green Blues, promising money and encouraging them to unseat the upstart sovereign. As we saw last episode, Justinian and his officials were deeply unpopular with the rich, and this was a golden opportunity for them to harness the anger of the crowds to get themselves a ruler more to their liking. Justinian had more to worry about than his house guests, though. He had little faith in the palace regiments, the Scolaris and the Excubitors. He had done little to engender their loyalty and had sold off posts in the guard to raise cash. He was increasingly surrounded by men he suspected might throw him to the wolves outside. There were a number of men he felt he could trust, though. Obviously John and Tribonian, whose fate was now linked to his, but also Belisarius, who was in the city waiting reassignment, and Mundus, the Gepid prince, who was passing through on his way back to the Balkans. Belisarius had his Bacalarii with him, and Mundus's retinue included a company of heralds. Between them, they probably had about 1,500 men, who now stood at the gates, protecting those in the palace from the mob outside. The next day, Thursday, Belisarius led the assorted soldiers out to confront the crowds outside the gates, and bitter fighting took place around the Augusteon. The professional soldiers inflicted nasty casualties on the rioters, but didn't have the strength to cow the far greater numbers. Belisarius was forced to return to the palace, leaving the rebels further enraged by their emperor. More buildings were burnt down as the city's clergy made futile attempts to restore order. For the next three days, the city was engulfed in street fights and arson. On Friday, the mob set fire to the Praetorium again, as it had only been partly burned by the initial fire. Whether by accident or design, soon the baths of Alexander were destroyed. Then the hospice of Eublis, the church of Hagia Irene, and the hospice of Samson. Many private houses and apartments went up in smoke too. Business had stopped taking place. Smoke hung in the air. Those who had somewhere to go fled the city. At some point, Justinian gave orders for boats to be manned and prepared, should he need to flee. By Saturday, some more troops arrived by ship from local cities. With his numbers bolstered, Belisarius set out from the palace again and made battle with the mob in the quarters of the Chalcoprator, near the Basilica. The mob had occupied a nearby building known as the Octagon, which was also set on fire during the fighting. The flames spread south this time, destroying the palace of Lausus. The palace was filled with treasures which were consumed or melted down, and the church of St. Theodore Sphoratius went next. The fire raged along the Mise towards the form of Constantine, destroying everything in its path, the colonnades, the shops, the church of St. Aquilina. By Saturday night, the complex of palace buildings was effectively isolated by the rioters. Justinian was being besieged, and his paranoia was understandably growing. Once night fell, he gave the order for all the senators in the palace to leave and return to their homes. Before they left, Hypatius and Pompeius swore to Justinian that they were loyal to him and had had nothing to do with the rebellion. After years of faithful service to the new regime, Justinian probably believed them. On Sunday morning, it was time to gamble. 
Justinian may well have been present on that amazing day when Anastasius took off his diadem and offered to resign in the Hippodrome. He saw the way the crowd's anger subsided in the realization of what they might lose. While not going quite that far, he attempted his own theatrical stunt by appearing before the crowds in the Cathisma and swearing on a copy of the Gospel, offering a general amnesty for any crimes committed in the last week and promising to listen to the demands of his people. But what had worked for Anastasius did little for Justinian. No one believed him. A few cheers were soon drowned out with boos and catcalls. Some smart Alec asked whether the oath Justinian was swearing was worth the same as the one he'd given Vitalian. Less witty cries of liar went up amongst the general uproar, and then some cries of long live Hypatius. News that Anastasius' nephews had left the palace had now filtered out. The rebels rushed to Hypatius' home and dragged him to the Forum of Constantine, crowning him with a gold chain. His wife was along, objecting all the way, commenting that the chain was more noose than crown. Hypatius probably felt the same way, but now met with other senators who advised him to occupy one of the minor palaces and wait Justinian out. The other option was to just storm the palace and kill all those inside. But fears of the casualties that would ensue led to some debate. The Green Blues were impatient, and Hypatius himself favoured a swift end to the affair. In the end, a mob raised Hypatius up on their shoulders, bore him to the Hippodrome, and lifted him into the Cathisma, much to the delight of the crowd, who loudly hailed him emperor, and continued to yell abuse at Justinian and Theodora. The excubitors, sensing the end of the conflict was at hand, entered the box to protect Hypatius from attack from the palace entrance. On hearing this, Justinian decided it was time to leave. The consensus amongst his advisers was to make for Heraclea on the European coast nearby in Thrace. The men seemed broadly in agreement, until the Empress Theodora intervened. Although the speech which comes down to us is undoubtedly fictitious, the sentiment seems entirely plausible. The former prostitute was determined not to lose the status she had so amazingly won for herself. She pointed out how intolerable exile would be for those who once ruled the empire, and questioned if death was not preferable to going on the run. She closed with the line that the imperial purple would make the finest burial shroud. Either convinced by her argument, or shamed by the boldness of a woman, Justinian and his men remained. Turning to the two options available to him, Justinian gathered a large bag of cash and handed it to a trusted Armenian eunuch named Narses and told him to seek out the leaders of the Blues. Narses was instructed to remind them that Anastasius had always favoured the Greens, and so surely Hypatius would too. What would stop their new emperor from leaving the Blues out in the cold in his new regime? Justinian clearly trusted Narses a lot. Remember that Justin only came to power because he had been handed a bag of bribes and used them to his advantage on the last occasion that there had been a crisis of succession. Narses, though, was worthy of the emperor's trust, and the seemingly frail man slipped unnoticed from the palace and located the leaders of the blues. He seems to have been successful, as a number of blues appear to have abandoned the rebellion around this time. The other option, the military one, was now exercised too. Justinian ordered Belisarius to attack the crowds while they were gathered in the Hippodrome. Belisarius initially wanted to use the passageway to the Cathisma and simply snatch Hypatius away. However, the excubitors were unmoved, 
and so he had to make his way to the hippodrome floor, climbing through rubble and smouldering ruins. There again he was blocked. Entering through the west side, Belisarius could see that if he tried to force his way up the spiral staircase which led to the imperial box, his men would have to turn their backs on the crowd, who would surely fall on them. So instead he gave the order to attack. From the other side of the Hippodrome, Mundus led his men in through the dead gate, so-called because it was the place where fallen charioteers were taken. The Hippodrome was 117 metres wide by 500 metres long, but plenty of that space was taken up by the seating. The crowd, which numbered somewhere between 30 and 50,000, were mostly on the arena floor. In close ranks, 500 armed men could make a line four or five deep across the width of that floor. Once inside, they began to attack indiscriminately. It was a massacre, as the crowd was caught between two sets of armed killers marching slowly toward them. The majority of people were unarmed. Some of the Greens were said to be wearing armour, but in the press of panicking and hysterical rioters, there was little they could do, as the disciplined soldiers methodically cut them down. Procopius reports that 30,000 lay dead at the end of the day. Other sources say more, though it's not clear whether the estimates are based on the merely wounded or the actual dead. Either way, the casualties were enormous. The stench was terrible, the ground covered in gore, the city silent. With a population of around 500,000 people, everyone in Constantinople was touched by the toll. Hypatius and Pompeius were brought before the emperor. Justinian probably knew that they were innocent of any real crime, but at the prompting of Theodora and common sense, he couldn't allow them to live in case they became rallying points for another rebellion. They were executed the next day, and their bodies thrown into the sea. Their families were left unharmed, but their estates were confiscated. Eighteen other senators were similarly disinherited and banished for their part in what had happened. Some years later, when feeling secure on the throne, Justinian actually restored some of the property to those families. But for now they were gone, and Justinian's position was much strengthened. Effective opposition to his regime was silenced. Over the next few years, Justinian's projects would gather pace in such a way that he may have viewed the Nika revolt, as it would become known, as confirmation of his destiny. The centre of Constantinople was, of course, in ruins. One eyewitness says that the city was uninhabitable because of dust, smoke, and stench of materials being reduced to ashes, striking pathetic dread in those who beheld it. Justinian looked at the charred ruins of the city in a different light. The great builder had just been handed the chance to remodel the capital of his empire to his own specifications. An ironic consequence of the revolt was to actually give Justinian the opportunity to cement his legacy in stone for future generations to see. The city prefect would be in charge of reconstructing houses and minor buildings, but for the most important structures that had fallen, Justinian would direct the architects personally and reimagine the city on a grander scale, one fitting of the greatness of the Roman Empire. The Christian Roman Empire, of course. Only 40 days after it had fallen, workmen were preparing the ground for a new Hagia Sophia, one Justinian had clearly already been dreaming of. As I said at the start of the podcast, the Nika revolt marks a turning point in the history of Byzantium. 
Contemporaries like Procopius bemoaned that Justinian had destroyed the last vestiges of Romanness from the empire, ushering in an Eastern-style autocracy. While it's certainly true that the Deems would never again unite in rebellion, it's highly debatable if they represented anything to do with the kind of republican virtues that Procopius and his ilk like to celebrate. Where Procopius may be onto something, though, is the way in which senatorial influence and privilege had begun to disappear. During the last century, the emperors had been so concerned with gaining the upper hand over Goths and Isaurians that senators had been able to enjoy rather loose reins of government. Between the new taxes, tightening restrictions, and the attack on pagan learning, it's clear why the old Greco-Roman aristocracy would feel that Nika represented the end of an era. For the rest of his days, Justinian's power went unchallenged by the elite, and he was free to remake the empire without worrying about treading on their toes. Of course, the revolt was a horrible, scarring incident. Contemporary historians were very critical of Justinian for the slaughter he ordered. Many people were heartbroken, widowed, or destitute. The emperor, too, was left with a permanent reminder that those who kissed his robes might one day stick a knife through them. Within a year, John the Cappadocian and Trebonian were both back at their posts. However, Justinian reined in John's tax regime and kept an eye on Trebonian's legislation. He had been given a warning about the excesses of his regime and was not likely to forget how close he came to losing everything. For Mundus, Narses, and Belisarius, though, promotion awaited. They had all been there when the emperor needed them, and he would reward them with important duties. In two weeks' time, Belisarius will be reassigned. If the Roman Empire was to be restored, then its lost western provinces must be retaken. And what better place to start than with Africa, where those Aryan vandals were about to feel the wrath of the Orthodox Emperor. <laughs>